Welcome to All Heart. I have a remarkable story today that is a lesson on why you should follow through with a feeling that you've been given. Now, obviously, you can't always uh, go on your feelings, but when the feeling is so strong and powerful, you need to move. Because you took my scars, bruises, and This is the story of how I came to Nashville. Look, I'm a Salt Lake City, born and raised Utah boy. I love snow. My family grew up snowmobiling and I learned to ski after my heart transplant. I'm a, you know, I'm an outdoorsy guy. I like fishing, I like camping. I have so many memories of that and love it because that's the childhood experience that my grandfather who fought in World War II started and provided for all of us and so that was my love so coming to nashville music city was not something on my list so i had built in utah a record label that was you know stone angel music and the heart of all of that has been my entire purpose and mission of life which is to create music to help you create an atmosphere of peace so you can have harmony in the home You can have music for sleep, for study, for background, or just to be present, to meditate, to pray, to feel closer to God. And, you know, when I first discovered that gift of music, I developed it into a talent and and I learned my purpose. I know you have gifts. You've worked on those gifts. They become a talent and you've used those gifts in your life to to lead you, to give you a purpose to where you're able to contribute to make the world better. And that's really what this podcast is all about. All my guests, we talk about where they are, what their gifts are, and how they're contributing to society. And we get into the heart of things they believe in. I basically want to give to you like this beautiful masterclass gift of understanding how other people are developing their gifts and using those to make the world a better place. It's very encouraging. All right, back to to this story. So I started Stone Angel Music, and the reason I did that was because after I was with Virgin Records, I did two albums for Virgin Records, The Christmas Box and The Looking Glass, and they wanted me to start doing smooth jazz. This was back in the late 90s. And Napster happened. If you don't remember Napster, That was when you could get a hold of music for free because the internet was exploding and you could download any album, anything you wanted. And the idea of going to the record store was done, was done. And uh, it was a beautiful time because I could get access to any music. It was a frustrating time because here I was uh, seeing my own music being downloaded illegally. Well, the record labels, it just threw them into commotion. And so they started losing money. And Virgin Records that I was signed to had this sub-label Narada that was the imprint of all of my music. Well, what's fascinating is they got absorbed. The accountant embezzled. Uh, they got absorbed and they were just in a bad, bad place. So with smooth jazz and the record labels just falling apart, I just made the decision I'm going to leave. I think I've got enough knowledge. I've got some distribution relationships. I'm going to start my own label. And I really love the music business. I love communicating with other people and learning about other things. And a lot of artists like to just sit in the studio and create and then go out and perform. I love meeting the executives and and marketing and and all the advertising, the public relations. I love all that because I had studied how musicians got to where they are. I would read a Billboard magazine. I would read a Rolling Stone. And, you know, when you're a a teenager and you're playing the piano, the thought of making money from playing the piano is just absurd. You know, how am I going to do that? But at the time, there was Yanni and George Winston 
And these guys had found a way to have a voice for piano music, but people love piano music. They really, it, it is one of the top selling forms of art within the industry. And a lot of the labels don't even realize that or recognize the value of it. If you go on to YouTube, you'll see that majority of the videos that have a ton of views are the relaxing videos. So I'm grateful that God led me into this to be able to play from my heart and create music that is a tool to help you create that atmosphere of peace. So I started my own label. I called it Stone Angel Music. The Stone Angel, where did that come from? Well, that came from the second album I ever did, which was The Christmas Box, inspired by Richard Paul Evans' story, The Christmas Box, which was a number one New York Times bestselling book. Richard actually uh, commissioned me to make an album inspired by the novel, and we would tour the country, and as people were waiting in line to buy a book, this may have been one of you waiting in line to buy the book, I would sit and play the keyboard or the piano, and this was the music of the Christmas box. Well, in the story, there's this stone angel statue in a cemetery, and this is where a parent can go who had lost a child that never got a chance to bury that child. It may have been SIDS, it may have been a miscarriage, it may have been some other circumstance. And I understood this, I related to this. Uh, me and my wife had given birth to twins early. They were 21 weeks, we lost them. It was very devastating and painful. So the stone angel meant something very personal for not only me, but for millions of people that had read the Christmas box. So that's why I wanted Stone Angel music because the music we create is somewhere between this life and the next. There's something holy and beautiful and sacred about what we're doing. And it doesn't matter if you're a Christian or a Muslim or you're Jewish or you're Hindi, all denominations, all religions of people have been absorbing this music and it's been fascinating. It's fascinating to know that there's a brotherhood in India. Munazer, who wanted to lead a fan club for me in India. Uh, this is about an hour from New Delhi where there's a university of Muslim students. Hello everyone, myself Munazer, and I'm from India. I like his music because when I listen to him, I feel peace all the world there because I never heard any kind of music earlier before than Mr. Paul Carter. I love his music. And I will recommend you to listen to him in silence where you can feel the beauty of his music. And I'm from India and i became a big fan of him just because of his great art and uh it's been fascinating to see this happen so with stone angel music i started to sign artists that i really enjoyed playing with one of those was stephen sharp nelson he was a cello player playing locally i got a chance to interview him and you need to go back and listen to that episode. It is so encouraging, so inspiring, because Steve did not believe people would be interested in him or cello music. I reminded him about Yo-Yo Ma. We all love Yo-Yo Ma. So <laughs> Steve, we did this album called Sacred Cello, and I could not, he could not believe this, but we, we debuted we debuted on the Billboard charts right next to Yo-Yo Ma on the classical charts. And so that gave him the inspiration, the motivation to keep going. Well, eventually he became uh, the, the other member of the Piano Guys with John Schmidt. The Piano Guys have hundreds of millions of views of their covers on YouTube. Steve went from not believing in himself to playing sold out arenas worldwide. It's a remarkable story. These are the types of episodes that we have on All Heart.
I signed other artists, Ryan Tilby, a guitar player who has his hands in almost everyone's album in the Intermountain West. He's mastered most of the albums that I've done in the last couple of years. He's just a brilliant guitar player. And I said, let's make a guitar album called Guitar Hymns. And it's incredible the way people have discovered his music on Pandora and other platforms without him having to tour. So we, I've signed other artists as well. The Worth of Souls project was one of the, the pinnacle things I was able to be the producer of, Worth of Souls. I basically went to former American Idol contestants that have a connection to Utah because the governor of Utah, when I was living in Utah, had basically said there's a very serious situation with the, the suicide rates in Utah. People are depressed. And we need to figure out how to encourage them. So I gathered a bunch of musicians together that were known. Ashley Hess uh, from American Idol, Jordan Moyes, Ken's Hall, uh, the list goes on and on, Sierra Luran. And we put together an album. And if you like Christian music, Christian music that is not cheesy, but Christian music that really helps you understand your value, that is what Worth the Souls was. I think that music is the language of emotion. And you know, we always hear that where words fail, music speaks. And I truly believe that. Music takes us to a place that allows us to relive moments. It's a way that we can heal and we can feel the spirit, we can feel strength. The whole purpose of Worth of Souls is to reignite that fire that once burned in us so deeply. Come out of sadness from wherever you've been. Come broken hearted, let rescue begin. Unfortunately, we live in a day and age where we base a lot of our worth off of the amount of likes we get and the amount of shares and hits and views and all of that. There's so much comparison, there's so much bullying, there's so much negativity, there's so much confusion. I've had uh, several friends who have taken their lives, who have given up. It hurts. I think God weeps. I think He hurts when we hurt. The Worth of Souls Project is a group of artists that have come together to remind everyone that listens that God is there. We worked with such a talented group, they really know what they're doing and who they are. We're all united in the same cause. It's kind of like a lifeline to help others and lift them out of their pain. I want people just to pay attention to the words. I've been in this dark place, hoping I'd find your face. God, I don't need no space. Sometimes our natural reaction is to just want to ask God to take it away. As hard as that is, I think the more important thing we should be asking God is to give us the strength to keep going. No matter how deep we go and how dark it gets, and if you hang on, there will be a time you'll look back and say, I am so grateful I didn't give up. God knows us individually. He knows our souls. He knows the trials that we face every day. He knows the mistakes that we make, but He loves us regardless. Sometimes we have to go through the refiner's fire uh, to mold us in a way that makes us who He designed us to become. This song is a song of mercy in compassion, the chorus really hits hard. I am redeemed, you set me free. I really connect with lyrics in songs, and um, that's why I really loved being a part of this album. You break my chains, you What is the worth of a soul? I believe that the worth of souls is priceless. Our souls have worth. God promised to never leave us or forsake us. He understands 
what it's like to go through valleys. He will always come to us when we need him. You don't need to earn God's love, it's there. We can't give up, we can't just give in to the hard things. The dawn is gonna break. The songs help people understand how valuable they are to God and how much He loves them. The worth of souls is great in your eyes, is great in your eyes. We just need to look out for each other and love. Regardless of where we are now, our future is incredibly bright. Stone Angel Music was this beautiful record label, and it was kind of my baby business, and I loved it with all my heart. And I was thriving out in Utah. Just thanks to all of you that have listened to the music over years, I've been able to fuel everything that we're doing. And so, you know, I got invited. I got invited to go to New Orleans. This was in November of 2016. I spoke at this convention for the American Heart Association. And then my wife and I, because we like road trips, we were going to drive from New Orleans up to Cleveland where her mother lives and have Thanksgiving. And I said, we got to go through Nashville. I've never been to Nashville I like country music growing up in Utah, being a outdoorsy, love to camp, love to fish. Uh, I love country music and it's easy to listen to. I don't have to think too much. Let's go to Nashville. Now you have to understand Nashville is not just country music. We tend to think Garth Brooks, Alan Jackson, Miranda Lambert, you know, but Alan's not even, Alan's from Georgia and uh, Garth is from Texas. Miranda's from Texas. So ideally, there's not very many artists that are actually from Tennessee, but uh, they all come here because the record labels thrive in this state. This is one of the states where there's no income tax and there's very small long-term capital gains tax compared to others, other states. So when you think of Nashville, people are coming here, not necessarily because it's a beautiful thing, you know, the sunrise coming in this morning was just amazing, but, but it's a beautiful thing. It's, it's because of money and you always have to kind of follow the money and financially it's been, it's made a lot of sense for people to be here. We have a lot of Californians moving here. We have a lot of people from New York. So that, and that changes the dynamics of the politics. So as we're driving up from New Orleans, which was amazing to go to New Orleans, and we're driving up and we come into Memphis, you know, we go to Graceland. I've got to see where Elvis recorded at Sun Records, you know, Johnny Cash, Jerry Lee Lewis, Roy Orbison, the, the greatest legends that kind of created that whole um, early rock and roll country blues, all that stuff happened at, Sun, you know, at, at uh, Sun Records out there in Memphis. Went to where Martin Luther King was assassinated. Very sobering, very sobering, very heartbreaking. And then, you know, came up into Nashville and we had so much fun. The first thing I did uh, was I went to the cemetery where Johnny Cash is buried because I've been a fan of Johnny Cash primarily because this was a guy who was a mess. He was into drugs, illicit sex, just not a good, good lifestyle. And he went through this divorce. It was sad. But Johnny seemed to have this redemption take place in his life. And then he was an outsider that could go into prisons and encourage prisoners to know that they are loved by God, that somebody could forgive them. And I don't know that that's Johnny's place to forgive, but he could at least encourage and help them understand that they are valuable because maybe they ended up that way because nobody ever really treated them with love. Maybe they got beat. Who knows? Mental illness, all these things. So I had so much love and respect for Johnny Cash, not only as a songwriter, but as a human being. And so I went to the cemetery. I expected this big, massive monument, you know, like when you go to George Jones grave, but no, it was, uh, 
it, it was a flat stone and next to June Carter and some of the family members and band members that couldn't afford to be buried. Uh, Johnny had a lot for them. So I paid my respects. I had a prayer. I said, thank you for your music, for lighting the world with your, your story, encouraging people to find God. And uh, of course, then I went looking for George Jones' grave. I, I don't know why I'm into this, like, go to the cemeteries to see celebrities' graves, but it's because uh, I think my, my roots of being LDS and studying genealogy, and, uh, you know, even though I'm a, a non-denominational Christian now, I, I love my Mormon roots and, and the desire to understand the past. And in genealogy, we would basically study those who have lived. And so I was always fascinated with the musicians. I go to the cemetery where George Jones is buried. I can't find his grave. I'm frustrated. Now, if you know who George Jones is, he sings White Lightning. Um, just think of Hee Haw, like the very best guest artists on Hee Haw or in country music. Uh, Alan Jackson's hero, a lot of people's hero. So George Jones, you know, I'm looking for this grave and I'm thinking, where is it? I can't find it. Now, here's the thing. I'm looking as the sun is setting. My wife's in the car. She, she doesn't care about this stuff. <laughs> so I'm looking, trying to find it. And then I look through these bushes and all of a sudden out comes a possum. I was like, that's weird. I've never seen a possum before. And the possum is staring at me. And you know how they've got those little beady eyes? It's like it's kind of creepy. It's like a giant rat. So the possum comes out, it's looking at me and I'm looking at him. And all of a sudden he turns his head to the left. And then there it is. I see this massive monument grave to George Jones. And you know what it says on the headstone up above in the right? It says George Jones, the possum. That was his nickname, the possum, because he had little beady eyes like a possum. So is that just like crazy? That was one of those experiences where you're like, why is this happening? And uh, I went over, paid my respects. Thank you for your music. I love it. You know, it's not the music I do, but I respect and admire what you do. And then, of course, we went to the Ryman, the mother church of bluegrass music that is now kind of the mother church of country music. It's where it was kind of all born because the radio stations would carry the music uh, on the AM radio and people would hear it all over the country. And the Grand Old Opry is there. And that's where, you know, it later moved over to Opryland Mill, um, which is a bigger complex, but the mothership right there on Broadway. And we went to a show and it was fascinating. And then at the time, the show Nashville was on TV and we used to, you know, for mindless activity, watch the show Nashville. And we really liked one of the characters, Deacon Claiborne, who is Charles Eston, known as Chip. Um, and a uh, great actor. He was on The Office um, in one season. And, um, and he's been on so many other shows. So, and he's a musician. So then my wife and I are, are walking on Broadway and we go into Ernest Tubbs record store, which is the, one of the oldest country music stores. It's still there. They're still selling records. And I go in there with my wife and Charles Eston, Deacon Claiborne is playing the guitar with Mark Cauley, another person who is big in country music that was on the show. And we're like, oh, Nashville's freaking amazing. This is a, how is this possible? And we go right in. There's the guy from the show. And, and uh, we, we met both of them, got a picture with them. And uh, we just went to our hotel and was like, wow, Nashville's pretty cool. And then we left. And no intentions of coming back other than just for a vacation. And it was like, we're talking the way you do with your spouse, your partner, best friend when you're on a road trip. And uh, this is why road trips are so good. She goes, man, did you just love that? There was such a good feeling there. And then I had this overwhelming feeling like we need to go back. And then I look at her, she looks at me, she goes, I think we need to go back to Nashville. She was having the same feeling. And I was like, oh, we can't really do that. You know, my entire family, my company, everything, we're all out in Utah. 
So anyways, as we do, we pray about things and I basically put it out there. Um, God, if uh, we're supposed to be in Nashville, just give us those feelings of, of what we're supposed to be doing. And there's never any clarity. Like it's not this voice that comes and says, Paul, you need to move to Nashville. You have to go on your impressions because life is one shot. It's all you got. And uh, what you do now determines your future. And you have to sometimes take huge risks because huge risks result in beautiful benefits, memories, experiences you never thought could be provided you. And um, so obviously we decided to Lehigh it within a couple months, which meant let's grab a suitcase, let's go live in a hotel for a month and let's just see what happens. And so we began to just trust the process. We got into an extended stay. You know, we left our beautiful home in Utah. We're staying in this hotel. My wife's going to the gym. I'm kind of making my way around, trying to meet people. I didn't know anybody. I knew David Archuleta who lived here because we'd done a tour. I didn't know him that well. And another artist, Tom Worth, who was a songwriter. So I called Tom. I said, let's get together and maybe write a song. And then my good friend, Ellie Duke, uh, from she's an incredible artist. Her mom, Marcy Duke, I reached out to Marcy and I said, hey, can we get together for lunch? Kind of helped me understand some things. And she connected me with a, a music attorney who I could just go pick his brain about understanding Nashville. And so I hope what you're learning from this is that you can't just follow through on going somewhere. You have to then be proactive in trying to maneuver uh, and, 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 and seek people out and ask questions. And people want to help you. I, I know they want to help you. So as I'm asking questions and I'm getting familiar, I'm meeting with people, we went to church. People were so good and so kind. And it was the reassurance that we were in a place where both my wife and I could feel loved and appreciated um, without any preconceived notion or idea. You know, I had roots in Utah. She had roots in uh, Cleveland and New York, having worked on Wall Street, not a lot of roots for her in Utah. And we wanted to just go somewhere where we both could just learn together. There happened to be a music conference here when, and that happens all the time, it's Nashville, happened to be a music conference. I go to this conference and I meet with people that I've worked with from Utah on the streaming platforms, Apple Music, iTunes, you know, Sound Exchange which is a government entity that helps feed uh, streaming royalties to artists. And I know this is getting boring talking about the inside business aspect of it. But as I was doing that, I came and uh, was approached by a young man who wanted to represent me as a manager. I've never had a manager. I feel like I can manage my own career. My wife who worked on Wall Street has enough knowledge to give me feedback. And that's kind of how we've gone. But this young man became my manager. And then started introducing me to other people. Well, there was a thing in the industry that I didn't know existed, and that is called selling your catalog. And I'd heard about that a little bit when the Beatles catalog came up. All the music the Beatles had written was up for auction because it was owned by a record label and Paul McCartney wanted to buy back his music. And guess who was bidding against him? Michael Jackson, guess who they gave the catalog to, who got the biggest uh, result that, that had the most money put into it, was not Paul McCartney. It was Michael Jackson. That is where Michael Jackson got the money to build Neverland and all these things. Because writing music in the pop world, it's very difficult to earn money unless you're touring. Uh, because there's so many people involved. So you kind of need something else. A song is like a piece of real estate. It has value. If people want to visit that song, they're more likely to stream it and it becomes a popular piece of real estate. So it has value. I had a, this catalog of music and all of a sudden I had these attorneys all around me saying, you should sell your catalog. And 
the idea was to preserve a legacy because I have a heart transplant. What happens to your music when you're gone? What happens to your gift? If you're preserving art in some way, who's going to take care of that? Well, I made the conscious decision to sell the catalog, to preserve the, the music in time and in history. And this incredible company, Ole Entertainment, which is now Anthem Entertainment, was one of the uh, several companies to bid on this catalog we had built. The artists would continue to earn income well, the way they always had. I would just be shifting my, um, me being in charge to this other company that is global. And that's what we ended up doing. We sold the catalog. That's what happened. We came to Nashville. We sold Stone Angel Music. I signed the record deal with Anthem Entertainment. The goal was to release three albums. So the albums we released, you guys, I had so much fun making these. So the Christmas record, Peaceful Piano, and The Broken Miracle. Then my contract ended in August and I started, <laughs> I started All Heart Publishing. It's a brand new record label. I think you guys are the first to hear about this. It's a brand new record label. December is the first album on this new record label. Do you know your purpose? Are you fulfilled? And have you felt driven to where you are today or have you felt led by a higher power that puts us in these incredible situations to offer us the most beautiful life uh, that we can have. Do you know what a good feeling that is? Thank you for joining me for this first half of talking about Nashville, why I came to Nashville. You guys are amazing. We'll talk to you soon. Cause you took my scars, bruises and